hey, there you are. I'm excited. I'm ready. I'm blessed. I'm inspired. I'm fired up. I'm ready to get into the Word of God, and I believe that God's going to bless you tonight in a very special way. I want you to head over to the book of Genesis with me as we prepare to go into the Word of God, and I believe that God's going to bless you. I've got a, a message tonight that spoke to me in a powerful way, and I hope it speaks to you uh, in the same way. I'm going to be teaching on accountability. Don't, don't log off. Stay on. Stay with me right now. Accountability. It's a word we don't like to talk about because we don't like to be accountable to anything or anybody from anywhere. But if you're going to be a disciple, you must have a discipline. If you have a discipline, you must be accountable. If you're going to have accountability, accountability in itself is a form of worship because it acknowledges that there's somebody that I'm accountable to, that I'm not here by myself, that I'm not in this world by myself, that I am gifted, that I have something that has been commissioned to me. My strength, my health, my body, my talent, my resources, my job, my career, uh, my mind, my IQ, my intellect, all of it is gifts given to me. Job said, naked came I into the world and naked I shall return. So all I have to do is recognize, recognize my responsibility to be accountable to God, not for what he gave you, not for what he gave the guy down the street, but accountable for the things that he has given me. Now, if you're just logging on, you didn't get a chance to give throughout the time that I'm teaching from time to time, there, there will be a prompter on the screen giving you an opportunity to sow into the kingdom of God because you cannot reap what you do not sow. And so periodically you will have that opportunity. Avail yourself of that opportunity as we go to the word of God. But we're going on to the word of God. We've been waiting on it. We're excited about it. We're ready to get into it. Let's do it. We're going to Genesis uh, chapter number three, verse six through nine. And then we're going to go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 4 through 9. Uh, hear ye the word of the Lord. Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and, and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? Okay, we're going to stop there for a moment. Oh, Father, bless your word and sanctify it into our hearts and into our spirits as, as we delve into the word of God. Let us excavate from the treasures of your word those truths that are relevant to our lives and relevant to our deeper understanding of you. So while we understand who you are and what you require of us, we also want it to be cut to the continuity of our situation and be a rhema word that speaks to our lives in a special way. I thank you for what you're going to do, and I believe you to do it. I trust you to do it. In the name of Jesus, amen. We are in the book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings. Everything starts here in terms of understanding the plan of God. It does not explain God. It does not claim to explain God. It is not meant to explain the creation, though it, though it does chronicle the creation. The focus of the Bible is to reveal the plan of God for man's redemptive uh, salvation, that we might come into a deeper understanding that Satan had a trap, but God had a plan. And how do we walk into that plan, and how did we get into trouble, and how do we get out? That's what we want to know. And so there, throughout the uh, classes tonight, I'm going to give you five questions. You can call it an exam if you like. But these five questions are significantly important to me, and they're largely important because uh, God is asking the questions, not me. God is asking the questions. Not Moses, who is recorded to who have written the Pentateuch. It is not Moses asking the questions. God is asking the question. Okay. Now, you understand as well as I do that God created man from the dust of the earth. 
that he breathed into him the breath of lives and he became a living soul. And that God created a garden and an environment for man uh, to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue, and to have dominion. Five things, be fruitful, multiply, uh, replenish, subdue, and have dominion. God gave all of that over to man and put it in his hands and placed the man and his wife in the garden. They're walking around in the garden. There's only one commandment. Everything is lawful unto them. There's only one commandment uh, that there is a, the, the tree of life for their sustenance and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they are not to eat from. And there they are in, in the garden in a period that we call innocence. And they're walking around in, in innocence in the presence of God, uh, worshiping him and seeking him and serving him and understanding him. And the Bible says that... Uh, uh, the woman uh, had a conversation with, with Satan who comes in the form of a serpent. He is not a serpent. He is not a serpent, but he came in the form of a serpent. Satan can come in many forms. The way one place the Bible said he has transformed himself into an angel of light. He, he will come as a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. He has the ability to use whatever he will to manifest himself, but he comes in the form of a serpent. And the Bible says that she enters into this conversation, she engages him, which is a big mistake. She's going to talk to him. She has a conversation with him. She's not alone, though. The man is with her. The Bible says the man is with her. And the interesting about it, we have often uh, challenged women and chastised them for their responsibility uh, in the process. But the reality is the man was with her. Okay, he's not saying anything, but he's with her. You know how we do, man. Sometimes we don't talk, but he's with her. She's having this conversation with the serpent. And the serpent is trying to challenge what she knows about God because it is Satan's job to come against what you know about God. And he starts saying, hath not God said, you know, and, and he kind of put a little spin on the word of God to fit uh, what he's trying to get done. And the next thing you know, she is a partaker of the forbidden fruit, whatever that fruit was. I don't know what it was. You don't know what it was. We don't know what it was. We can speculate apples, oranges, watermelons could be kumquats. I don't know. But whatever it was, it could be symbolic, not fruit at all. It could have been an action. I don't know. Whatever it was that she was not supposed to do, she did it. The Bible talks about why she did it, though. The Bible says that when she saw, let me get this right because I, want, I think this is important. The Bible says that when she saw uh, that, the, let me go back here. Yeah, in verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, uh, the lust of the flesh, hunger, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, the lust of the flesh, she partook of the fruit. Now, it's important for you to understand what I just pointed out to you. In those three things is all that the world has to offer you. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. The Bible will later say that's all that's in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And in this seduction process that goes on between the two of them, the enemy is using all that is, that is available to him. And that's all he has to use on you. That's all he has to use on me. That's all he has to use on any of us. Now the details might be different. It might not be bread. It might be something else, but it's always the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, something he exposed you to that you saw, uh, or the pride of life, your ego, your pride, uh, those issues that are, are not necessarily uh, driven by passions, the lust of the flesh, or given by uh, illicit wandering of the eye, the lust of the eye. Then the third category is the pride of life is all that he has to use. And that's all God's concerned about. We get down into the details of sin, but God gets into the categories of sin because the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin, but he wasn't tempted in all ways. He couldn't be tempted in all ways. He didn't get married. He couldn't be tempted to cheat on his wife. There were certain details that he couldn't be tempted with due to his situation because details didn't matter. The points mattered. The lust of the flesh the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. When Jesus, after that he's baptized in the Jordan River and goes out into the wilderness to be tempted, he is also tempted in the same way. If thou be the son of God, turn this stone to bread. The lust of the flesh. You know you're hungry. You've been fasting 40 days. You know you're hungry. 
This is the lust of the flesh. Use your power to turn something into something that it is not, to satisfy the lust of the flesh. And Jesus rebuked him with the word of God. The lust of the eye. Come here, let me show you all these kingdoms will I give you if you bow down and worship me. Okay? Uh, and, and this is uh, the lust of the eye. Look at, look at what I can give you. Okay? And then he call, takes him up to a high place. You know, if you bow down and worship me, you know, I will give you power. I will make you ruler. The pride of life. That's all that there is the enemy has to work with. You pass these three tests, you got it licked. She didn't. She didn't pass this test. Not only did she not pass it, in particular the fruit, she gave it to her husband and he did eat. Now that's when all hell broke loose. Pardon my expression. It wasn't when the woman, woman was partaker of the fruit. It was when the man was partaker of the fruit. And the Bible said that when Adam fell, all, man fell, all mankind fell in him, fell because of him. Because it was him. Why was it him? Eve was deceived. It is clear in the scriptures that Eve was deceived. It does not say that Adam was deceived. So Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. He made a conscious choice to die with his bride. Whereas the last man, Adam, made a conscious choice, a decision, first in the Garden of Gethsemane, finally executed on the cross, to die for his bride. One died with his bride. One died for his bride. And then when, they, when he died with his bride, whoom, their eyes were open. The innocence was gone. It's a terrible thing. They lost their innocence. Terrible thing. Some of you know what I'm saying. You, to lose your innocence, your naivete. And all of a sudden, you see things in a perspective that you've never seen them before. Exposed to something you shouldn't have been exposed to. Boom, their eyes opened, and they knew that they were naked. This is powerful stuff I'm giving you tonight. They knew that they were naked. See, you cannot convict somebody of a crime if they didn't know that they did it. If they didn't know, it might be manslaughter. It can't be murder. Sometimes it can't even be manslaughter if they are judged incompetent of their ability to comprehend right from wrong. That's why they bring in psychologists in a court case to make sure that the person is competent enough to stand trial. Do you know what you're saying? That's why they read you Miranda rights and ask you, do you understand what I'm saying? Because they have to make sure that you're competent. The Bible is clear. They knew. Okay. And because they knew, they, their, their eyes were open. They knew that they were naked. They knew that they were naked. They heard the voice of God walking through the cool of the garden. They both heard him. They both ran and hid themselves. They both were afraid. They heard his voice. Let me put it in order. They heard their voice. They knew that they were naked. They were afraid. They hid themselves. They heard. They knew. They were afraid. They hid. Those four things encompass most of us. They heard the voice of God. They knew that they were naked. Instead of coming out and saying, I made a mistake. I don't know how to fix this. They were afraid, and they hid. Anytime you see somebody hiding, it's not because they're wicked, it's because they're afraid. They knew, they heard, they knew, they were afraid, they hid. That's what you're down. It'll help you to understand people. It'll help you understand your children. It'll help you understand your coworkers, your employees, the other people you go to church with. They heard God. They knew that they were naked. They were afraid. They hid. And the voice of the Lord walks through the cool of the garden. Now, they heard, they knew, they were afraid, they were naked. And the Bible says they sewed fig leaves to cover themselves, aprons, so that they would not be naked. They did, both of them together. Everything was they. They were both partakers of the fruit. They, 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 they. But God does not call they. The Bible says God cried out, Adam, 
where art thou? Now, tonight we're talking about accountability. We're not just rehearsing the story of Adam and Eve. We're really after accountability. And accountability says, first of all, that there's somebody above me. I'm not accountable if you're not above me. I'm accountable to the person who has given me stewardship. I'm accountable over the one who has gifted me. I'm accountable. If I take a loan out to the bank, I don't take the money and give it to the neighbor across the street because I'm not accountable to the neighbor across the street. I'm accountable to the one who has gifted me. God has gifted them. God has planted them in the garden. God has given them dominion. God has given them authority. They are accountable to God. That's why when they heard his voice, they knew that they were naked, they were afraid, and they hid themselves because they were accountable. And all of a sudden, that accountability has been, been challenged. But this is what I'm after. When the voice of the Lord walks through the cool of the garden, God, who is omnipotent, all-powerful, God, who is omnipresent in all places at all times, God, who is omniscient, who knows all things, the God who knows all things now ask a question. Now, when God who is omniscient and knows all things ask a question, do you really think that he wants you to inform him of something that he doesn't know? Or is it a rhetorical question? It is the first of five questions I'm going to give you tonight, and I'm going to get out of your way. God Almighty comes walking down through the cool of the garden and asks Adam a very simple but complex and complicated question to answer. Where art thou? He didn't ask where is Eve. He didn't ask where is the serpent. He didn't ask where is the fruit you left laying on the ground. He didn't ask that. He didn't ask where is the money. He didn't ask anything. He said, where art thou? He didn't ask you, where were your friends and where's your family? And then I know, no, where art thou? God wants to know, where are you? Accountability over oneself. That's the first thing, that's the first step to healing and restoration for you to come to grips with where am I? Where am I in life? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6 that the, the, the angels cried out, who will go and work for us? And the answer came from Isaiah, here am I, send me, I'll go. Here am I, is open disclosure. Here am I, nothing to hide, I'm coming out from behind the bushes. Adam has hid himself in the trees, covered himself with fig leaves. Maybe he thought God would think he was a tree. He has tried to look like who he's with, but he's not. Have you fellowship with trees to the point that you've lost your identity? And you tried to look like one of them, but you really weren't one of them. And you sewed on you a little fig apron so that you would appear like you're one of them. And you're in the club with them and you hang out with them and you laugh at their jokes and you listen at their stories and you try to fit in. And man innately is desired and wired to want to fit in. And Adam is hiding himself among the trees dressed in fig leaves. But he's not a tree. He's just dressed like one. Camouflage. Some of you are hiding out in places that you are not really one of them, but you're hiding out with them because you want so much to belong. Because you've gotten away from God and you're disconnected from God, so you want to be connected with trees. You are not a tree. Take the fig leaves off. You're not a tree. You're hanging with trees, but you're not a tree. You look like a tree, but you're not a tree. You do what they do. You wear what they wear. You go where they go, but you're really not one of them. And God is calling you out of the sociological construct that you have built around yourself to hide yourself in. And God is saying to you, not them, not they, where are you? Where are you? It's a hard question to answer sometimes. Where are you in your life? Where are you in your head? Where are you in your mind? Where are you in your understanding of God? Where are you? You come home, but you're not at home. You go to work, but you're not at work. 
You go to church, but sometimes you're really not there. And people don't notice that you're missing, but God knows that you're missing, that you've lost yourself in your circumstances, that you've lost yourself in your environment, that you've lost yourself in your problems, that you've lost yourself in your crisis, that you've lost yourself in the situation. And God is calling you as you are, naked, exposed. All things are open before him with whom we have to do. And God is saying, Adam, you may be uncomfortable. You may be afraid. But I call you out. You're not a tree. Where art thou? Accountability over oneself. Introspection is some of the hardest work to ever do. To really force yourself to locate yourself. Where am I? Where am I really? Am I here? Am I really here? When I'm present, am I really present? Or is my body someplace and my head someplace else? And how do I get it all back together again when it feels like it's all shattered and it's coming apart? And God is saying, Adam, hey, Adam, where art thou? It's a wake-up call. It's not really God wanting you to inform him. It is God giving you a chance for self-discovery, accountability over oneself, where art thou? Not where is your wife? Not where is the serpent? Not is not where is all the people that got you into this trouble? Where is so and so? Where is it? No, 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 no. You'll never get better until you come to grips with this first question: Where art thou? I'm a drug addict. I'm hiding in drugs. I'm hiding in problems. I'm hiding in sin. I'm hiding in sex. I'm hiding in trouble. Here I am. Afraid? Yeah. Naked? Yeah. Ashamed? Probably. Here am I. Come out with my hands up. You got me. I've located myself. Not just so that I can come to you, but also that I can come to me. You remember when the prodigal son said that he'd gone and spent all of his substance in riotous living and, 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 and spent it on harlots and ran out of money and all of his friends left. He ended up in the, in the hall pit and the Bible said he came to himself. What do you think that means? That he was unconscious? Absolutely not. He was about to eat the food that the swine did eat. He was not unconscious. And yet the Bible uses a word that sounds like he was unconscious, like, like somebody comes, comes to. He, he came to himself. Sometimes God will say, hey, 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 wake up. Where are you? Where are you right now? Where art thou? That's the first question. Where are you in your marriage, in your ministry, in your heart, in your life? It is a hard question because it requires absolute honesty. And it's so much easier to talk about where other people are and what they need to do and what's going on in their life and what's wrong with them and what was wrong with your mother and what was wrong with your father and what was wrong with your neighborhood and what was wrong with your school teachers, what was wrong with your preacher. God didn't ask you about them. He's asking you about you. Where art thou, Adam? And Adam starts talking about everybody else. Well, the woman thou gave me, you know, excuses. She says it's a serpent. No, no. Accountability over oneself. I'm challenging you to come to yourself and say, well, I heard that voice. I came to church. I'm, I'm listening at the Bible class. I was naked. I hid myself. I was afraid, and I hid myself. I heard. I knew. I heard that voice. I was afraid. No, I heard that voice. I knew I was naked. I hid myself.
let's 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 go deeper into this if we will. Let's go just a little bit deeper. He is hidden out with the trees. He has pulled some fig leaves together, he and the woman, and they have made aprons. The moment they pulled the fig leaves, the fig leaves were just like the, the man and the woman. The fig leaves were separated from its source of life. Tied to a branch, Jesus said, I am the branch. The branch goes into the soil. Jesus said, except ye abide in me, and I in you. And all of a sudden, he has disconnected the fig leaves. You know why he's disconnecting other things? Because he's disconnected. Hurt people hurt people. Disconnected people want to disconnect other people. He disconnected the fig leaves because he is disconnected and he's just like them. While he's sowing them, they're dying. And the one who's sowing them is dying. And they're both dying because they're separated, not because they cease to exist. Death in the scriptures is not the cessation of life. Death in the scriptures is separation. Where art thou? Where art thou right now? What's, what's up with you? That's what God is saying. That's what God is saying. What's up with you? Where are you? I know how I created you. I know how I left you. I know how I formed you. I blew the breath of life into your nostrils. I caused your lungs to breathe. I know you. This is not you. Where art thou? That's question number one. Self-accountability. I got to come back to me. I am not one of these trees. I don't care how many fig leaves I put on. I'm really not one of them. I dress like they dress. I walk like they walk. I laugh at their jokes. I, I go to the Christmas party with them, but I'm really not one of them. And God says, stop dressing up like something you're not. You're not a tree. You're a man. Come out. from behind those trees because I want to deal with you. Can I go deeper tonight? I, th I, think we're, I think we're having a talk with God. And I think that's a very important thing. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 4 through 9, we will find uh, Cain and Abel. Now, Cain and Abel have been born. They are the children of Adam and Eve. This is after the fall. They have been born in sin. They were not born before their parents fell. Had they been born before their parents fell, perhaps they would have had eternal life. But, but now they've got damnation. They're born in sin and shaping in iniquity because they are born up under the curse of their parents. And now that they have grown up, the Bible says, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he, did, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto him, Why art thou wroth? Question number two. Why are you angry? What are you, what are you angry about? Cain, why are you angry? Are you comparing yourself with Abel? Are you envious of your neighbors? Are you upset with the other church down the street, the other choir, the other singer, the other vocalist? Why are you angry? Are you upset with your sister, your brother? Why are you angry? You got to get down to why are you angry? God is asking questions. The judge of the universe has hit the scaffold and he's questioning the witness. Why are you angry? You'll never get better till you answer that question. There have been times in my life that I was angry and didn't even know I was angry. Arguing somebody down was trying to talk to me. You're angry. I said, I am not angry. I'm not angry. I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm, but ye, see, I'm good. I'm good. About an hour and a half later, I came to myself and I thought, oh my God, I am angry. 
I was talking nice. I was talking nice about people that I was secretly, even hidden from myself, angry with. Why are you angry? The truth of the matter with Cain is that Cain was angry because God had had respect unto Abel's sacrifice. And God had blessed Abel. And he had rejected Cain. And Cain felt rejection and alienation and separation. And he was angry. He was so angry. He was so angry. Somebody I'm talking to tonight, beneath everything, makeup, eyelashes, nice dresses, suits, ties, jeans, whatever you wear, beneath all of that camouflage, you're angry. And that's why the marriage isn't working. That's why the job isn't prospering. Because you're angry. You're angry like Cain. You're angry like Hannah. Hannah was angry. You remember Hannah in the Bible? She was angry with Penina. And she finally went to church and she had to pour out before she could ever receive. She wanted to have a child. There was no room to have a child. She was full of anger. You can't be pregnant with life and death. In the old church, we used to call it purging. They put you on an altar and they'd have you calling on Jesus till you started foaming at the mouth. It wasn't a pretty sight, but they'd have you calling and calling and calling. They called it purging. Sometimes we need to do that, not the way the old church did, but we need to get that, whatever that is on the inside out. If it's tears, if it's anger, if it's frustration, it's got to come out. You can't control it down in there forever. You're going to explode. You're going to implode. The second question of accountability is, are you accountable about your emotions? You are accountable for how you feel. You're not accountable for how they feel. You're not accountable for how they feel. You're not accountable for them. You're accountable for you. That's why forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. So you're accountable for you. Where are thou? Why are you angry? You're accountable for how you feel. You are accountable for how you feel. I'm not saying you're not justified, but you're accountable for how you feel. You can't control what life hurls at you. You can't control what people think of you. You can't even control what they say about you. The only thing you can control is how you respond to it. You can control whether you let it in or whether you let it change you. Why are you angry? I know you, Cain. This is not you. The third question. Let me go to the third question. I, I feel something starting to crack open. I don't know who it is, but I'm going to ride it until I break it. Number three. Why hast thou countenance fallen? You don't even look like yourself. Walking around. You don't look like yourself. I know you. I made you. I created you. God is saying, why is thy countenance fallen? See, over here, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if the enemy would have his way with you and do what he wants to do, he wants to take your joy away until your countenance falls. Because when your countenance falls, so does your strength. And God said, look at you. You don't look right. You're not yourself. Why has our countenance fallen? Why have you allowed this to affect the way you present yourself? When you come into work on defense and you went to choir rehearsal on guard, and you come in the house ready. I'm ready. Don't you even try it. I wish you would. I wish you would. I wish you would. I wish you would. Look at you. I wish you would. I wish. What's wrong with you? Why has that countenance fallen? Why has the light gone out in your eyes? Why has the enthusiasm gone out of you? You don't look right. God made you. And he says, I hold you accountable for how you present yourself. And you're not doing a good job. So we have three questions of accountability. 
the first one is to find you. Where are you? And after you deal with not being there and not being present and being hidden in your own life and hidden from pain and scared of being hurt again and scared of disappointment to the point that you've contorted yourself into something that you don't even know where you are anymore. After you deal with that, why are you angry? Why are you angry? Number three, why has the countenance fallen. The kids can tell, the dog can tell, the cat can tell, everybody can tell. You, you used to be the light in the house. You used to be the life of the party. <laughs> you used to be the person everybody was waiting on. You, you, why has that countenance fallen till you have now distorted how you present yourself? You've turned into something you really are not. I gotta do what I gotta do. I gotta do. Wait, 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 wait. Why has that countenance fallen? And then, number four, I'm almost through with God's exam for accountability. But number four is a doozy. I'll say it in the King James language if thou doest not well, will I not receive you? Did I not give you the same opportunity that I gave him? You see, the problem with Cain is that Cain has, has made the mistake of his father. His father and his mother sold fig leaves around themselves. And now Cain is trying to offer God the same cursed stuff that his parents did. It's a generational curse. He is operating as his parents did before they were covered by the blood. He's offering God the fruit of the ground. He's offering God works. No man can be saved by works. He's offering God that which has been cursed, that which comes from the ground. He's offering God the sins of his parents. Abel, on the other hand, is offering God what God required, what God himself went and got for his mother and father and covered them with the coats of skin. This kind of sacrifice says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. This is a sacrifice that God will accept. And then God hits Cain in the face with the facts. I'm not mad at you. I don't dislike you. I don't hate you. I haven't cursed you. You had the same opportunity that Abel did. Don't be angry with people because they sacrificed in ways that you wouldn't. Don't be angry with people who made better choices when you could make them too. God hits him in the fact, I am not a respecter of persons. But I am a respecter of sacrifice. If you do what Abel did, you could get what Abel's got. This is the turning, turning point of the text. This, 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 this fourth question, to me, is the opiate of the whole issue. It is simply this. Why don't you fix this? All Cain had to do right here was walk over to Abel and say, show me how to do what you're doing. But that would require humility. All he had to do was get clarification and go back out there and ask God and do what Abel did. If thou doest not well, will I not receive you? I got good news for somebody tonight. You are not cursed, and God does not hate you, and he doesn't dislike you, and he's not mad at you. He just will not accept your junk. You can't just bring any kind of thing to him and expect to get results and then be fussing like God is not fair 
and comparing yourself with people who paid the price or went back to class or went to school or prayed or trained or labored to get where they got or practiced to get where they got or offered up sacrifice or committed themselves unto God or sowed into the kingdom of God, and they planted seeds while you disregarded it and clicked off because you are not willing to offer up what it takes to be successful. You want success on credit. And God is saying to you tonight, Cain, why don't you fix this? If thou doest not well, will I not receive you? is an opportunity to me. It is the most powerful question. Number four is the most powerful question. And if you get it right, you'll never even have number five. If you get it right, you can start it over again. If you get it right, you can change the trajectory of your entire life. Why don't you fix this between you and your daughter? You can't be responsible for how they respond. You can only be responsible for how you feel. Why don't you fix this? You've always felt less than because you made less money and you were less successful and you didn't have with somebody else. Why don't you fix this? Why don't you focus and stop making excuses and stop being angry and stop letting your countenance fall and stop losing yourself in your chaos and your crisis? Why don't you stop hanging out with the trees why don't you fix this? This is grace. This is the fourth question, but this is grace all day long. If thou doest not well, will I not receive you? Cain never answered the question. And some of you, you go to church, and you clap your hands, and you know the gospel songs, and you play Kirk Franklin in the car and all that kind of stuff, and you got some of my CDs, and you listen to Bishop Evans, and you listen to different ones, and so all that's great, 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 great. Question is, why don't you fix this? You, you know, but why don't you fix this? If thou doest not well, will I not receive you? No, he wouldn't listen. No, he wouldn't listen. So he walks away, still angry, countenance still fallen, won't fix what needs to be fixed. And one day when he was out in the field, and Abel comes out into the field, he killed his brother. Who are you killing over what you will not fix? Is it your daughter? Are you killing her with your anger over your ex? Is it your son? Are you killing him trying to prove a point to somebody who went off and married somebody else because you're angry? Anger unchecked always leads to murder. Murder of reputation, murder of opportunity, murder of something, but it'll always lead to murder. Anger unchecked, Moses, will always lead to murder. Set you 40 years off schedule. It'll set you behind. Why don't you fix this? Cain killed his brother. His brother. His own brother. Because he didn't deal with his own self. He killed his brother. His brother never did nothing to him. Not one thing. Not anything to him. People will kill you that you never did anything to because of their own issues. Why don't you fix this? And this is what gets me. This, this, this right here is what gets me. This is what gets me. All he had to do was kill a lamb. But because he would not kill a lamb, he killed a man. This is what Jesus means when he says, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. What I'm asking you for is easier than what you're about to do. I only wanted a lamb, not a man. 
I want a man, but he's coming much later over in the story. His name is called Jesus. It's not Abel. But you ended up shedding innocent blood because you won't deal with you. Review. Where are you? Why are you angry? Why has that countenance fallen? Why don't you fix this? You're accountable for yourself. You're accountable for your emotions. You're accountable for how you present yourself. And you're accountable for the change of your behavior. Why don't you fix this? No. No. I won't listen. I'll go to church, but I won't listen. I'll listen to music, but I won't listen. I'll sing in the choir, but I won't listen. I'll let this stuff hide in my heart all my life. I won't listen. I'll pastor, but I won't listen. I'll be a bishop, but I won't listen. I'll be a businessman, but I won't listen. I'm going to be, this is just how I am, stubborn. And now you kill your brother. Now you beat your wife in front of your son and your daughter. Now you attack your husband, scratched up his face like a cat, but you're going to still get ready for choir rehearsal. Why don't you fix this? He killed his brother. I cannot tell you how many people kill their marriage, kill their opportunities, kill their careers. I admit, I've self-sabotaged myself. I understand what it's like. I get it. I'm not exempt from it. I'm not above it. I am one from among you. I'm just preaching the book. I'm teaching this book to you tonight to tell you that if you don't offer up the lamb, you're going to end up killing the man. And here comes God up to Cain, just like he walked up to his daddy and said, Adam, where are thou? Now he walks up to Cain and he asks him a question. Question number five. Where is thy brother? Question number five suggests to us that we are accountable for the people around us. There's some things we endure, not because we like them, not because we enjoy them, not because we're happy, not because it's what we want to do. Some things we endure for the betterment of the people we love. That you are accountable for the person at the desk across from you and the alto who sings behind you and the neighbor who lives down the street. That God is watching how you treat other people. And when you get through slashing them, because you're good at it, because you never let go of that anger, and you never fix your countenance, and you never fix your issues, and you're a slasher, God said, I heard the blood of thy brother crying up to me out of the ground. Don't you think you're accountable for those people you slashed with your tongue or your text or you trolls on social media? Don't you think God is going to hold you accountable for slashing people to ribbons just because you got a knife sharp enough to do it ought, to, ought not to mean that you should go ahead and slash your brother? I heard the blood of thy brother crying up to me out of the ground. Where is thy brother? And Cain is still a smart mouth. He answers a question with a question. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Hardcore. He's not a bad person, though. God loved him. God challenged him. God examined him. But he does hold him accountable. And when Cain got through killing Abel, now Abel is dead. 
the first family has their first murder and Cain is driven into the land of Nod, never to be gathered with his family again. And Adam and Eve are grieving because they've lost two sons simply because they would not answer the questions of accountability. We're accountable for ourselves. Where are thou? We're accountable for our feelings, our emotions, our moods, our attitudes. Why are you angry? You're accountable for the spirit you carry on your face and bring to work and bring around other people. Why has a countenance fallen? You're accountable for the lack of taking responsibility to do the hard work of fixing stuff. And it is hard and it is difficult. But God is saying, if thou doest not well, will I not receive you? That means number four is why don't you fix this? Because if you don't, you're going to lose your brother. Your brother may be your husband, it may be your wife, it may be your children, it may be your future. Where is our brother? I only ask you for a laugh. So tonight we're talking about accountability. We're talking about hard work here. This might sound easy, it might go quick, it might be tasty, it might be fruity, it might be fun. You might be writing all kinds of wonderful stuff down and sending it to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But the reality is, if you really take this accountability exam tonight, it's really hard work. I honest to goodness tell you it's hard work. And it's not a test you only take one time. Every so often in your life you go through it again and again and again. I know what I'm talking about. I've taken this test over and over again. I'm there, but I'm not there. I'm here, but I'm not here. I'm doing it, but I'm not doing it. Adam, where art thou? I hid amongst the trees. I dressed like them, I act like them. I really wasn't one of them, but they, they kept me company in my agony. You're not one of them. I call you out from the trees you dress like. Adam, where art thou? Why are you angry? Now that's a killer. That's a tough one. Because sometimes a grown man is angry over little boy stuff. And sometimes the reason the beautiful young woman all dressed up and smelling good and just a real cutie pie turns into an alley cat because the little girl in her is still hurting. Why are you angry and you scratch everybody away over somebody in your history? Why do you run around with your countenance fallen, you're accountable to carry a better spirit on your face than you do. Four, why don't you fix this? Why do you let the silence fill your house and fill your life until the, the kids can feel the tension why don't you fix this? I tried, I tried, I couldn't do it. Go back again. God is holding you accountable. Because if you don't do the hard work of humbling yourself and fixing this, and being accountable for your choices and your decisions and your behavior and stop telling yourself the lie that you're cursed, you're not cursed, you're loved. It's not too late. You're not in too deep. It's just gonna take a little sweat and it may take a little time to raise a lamb. I don't know, you may have to breed them. It may be next year. But why don't you get on the road to fixing this? before you end up with the fifth question. 
Where is thy brother? Tonight we talk about accountability. And it's 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 something we all have to do over and over again and do checkups and do physicals and and, and take exams over and over again at different moments in our life. And we don't always pass the test, I will admit it, but we must take the test over and over again until we get the courage to answer because Cain is here to teach us that questions we do not answer turns into murder. And we don't need another thing to die. Not me, not you, not us, not now. We don't need another thing to die because we were too hard, too tough, too stubborn to answer the question. Accountability. That's what he gave me to share tonight. And I'm sharing it with you. And you best believe that God wouldn't have me share it if you didn't need it. I don't know exactly what he's talking about. I'm just a mailman. I didn't open up the letter. I just dropped it off at your house. I don't know what names to call. I don't know what streets they live on. I don't know anything about them other than that God sent me to ask you the question. You have to come up with the answers. God bless you. I'm praying for you. Let's pray right now. Oh my God. This is hard work. This is a tough test. The questions are deep and complicated. They sound simple and mundane, ritualistic, maybe even trivial. But when you really dig into them, they are hard, hard, painful, gut-wrenching work. Rehabilitative work. Reconfiguring work, reconstructing work. But if that's what it takes. I hold myself accountable. I hold my emotions accountable. I hold the way I present myself accountable. And I hold my decisions and choices accountable. I'm going to fix this. And I am going to be accountable, Lord, for the people around me. I'm going to love better. I'm going to live better. I'm going to be nicer. I'm going to be kinder. I'm going to be more considerate. I'm going to be better. Help me to be better. I know I'll never be perfect, but let me be better. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm T.D. Jakes. The class is accountability. The church is the potter's house. And thank you so much for just listening. Questions. questions of accountability. That's all I have tonight. Question is, have a good evening. I I and the answer is no, 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 Oh, I love the Lord, for he's so dear to me. Oh, he died that I might be free. I was asked this question years ago, and the answer is still no, no, no. Question is. And the answer is yes.